Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton, and this is my weekly economic outlook. I guess it's the 102nd in a, a series that originally started uh, as a result of the COVID pandemic. Uh, it was originally a way to keep the CSFI, the think tank that at the time I, I was running, uh, relevant, but it's now a way to keep me, now at least semi-retired, um, I guess, busy. Um, well, where to start this week? Uh, last week, I was in East Hampton on Long Island. This week, I'm in a little Suffolk village, which is a major change of pace. Uh, the temptation, nevertheless, is inevitably to prattle on about Ukraine, but there really isn't that much to say that's uh, either new or, I guess, interesting. Though I do note two, a couple of things. First, increasing concern that the United States isn't carrying 100% of global public opinion with it, and in particular, that there are rumblings of uh, pro-Russian anti-Americanism in India, in Pakistan, in much of Africa, including South Africa, and in Latin America, both in Mexico and in Brazil in particular. I think that's not good, and it may get worse as the economies of these countries uh, are hit like innocent bystanders in a major traffic accident. Second, I note that uh, Bill Burns, the director of the CIA, last week said aloud what many of us have been thinking, that if we push Putin to the wall and we don't give him a face-saving way out, he may well be tempted to use nuclear weapons, and I quote, in desperation. Unfortunately, at least unfortunately, as far as I can see it, the Hawks in Washington, who just ran through another 800 million military aid package, bringing the US contribution in terms of military aid to over $3 billion, are increasingly open about their aims. They really, really want to rub Putin's nose in the dirt, regardless of what he might do if he's cornered. And they want to expand NATO right up to Russia's borders with Finland and Sweden as likely um, adherents. Third, I note that May the 9th is Victory Day in Russia, uh, by which time Putin really has to have achieved something that he can present to the Russian people as some sort of victory. Um, that's a really important deadline, even, even to an autocrat. And I, I do hope that our diplomats are working towards something that will give Putin at least a fig leaf to hide behind, simply hoping that if we squeeze him, squeeze them all hard enough, the oligarchs will stick the knife into Vlad, isn't, I fear, going to cut the mustard. We, we may have turned to Bramovich, but there are many others closer to Putin who so far show no sign of defection. In the meantime, Western companies that have been forced to quit Russia are also counting their losses. BP is said to be the biggest loser, uh, down about $2 billion as a result of the forced sale of its Russian assets. But Citibank, City may actually have lost more. And some of the losses on the consumer side will be enormous. McDonald's, for instance, used to have 847 outlets in Russia and employed 62,000 people. But enough of that, at least for this week. For this week, the big story really is likely to be the fund bank spring meetings, the IMF World Bank spring meetings in Washington, which uh, formally begin later today, that's Monday. Although the World Bank's president, David Malpass, has already made his personal pitch for a $170 billion package to compensate poorer countries for the impact of the Ukrainian war, the pandemic, and inflation. I have to say that's a pitch that will almost certainly have fallen on deaf ears. The focus of attention will primarily be on the IMF and specifically on the three key reports uh, that it is due to publish the World Economic Outlook, which is due later today, the Global Financial Stability Report, which looks at the major financial risks uh, affecting the global economy, and the Fund's Fiscal Monitor, which looks at the state of public finances. Since, since it's pretty obvious to 
all of us what the major risks are. And since we're all too aware that the pandemic blew a hole through any kind of fiscal restraint, I think the media will zoom in on the WEO, the World Economic Outlook, and particularly on its revised uh, forecasts, growth forecasts for the global economy. Well, obviously, these forecasts are even more uncertain this year than they are usually dependent, as they are on a fairly rapid wind down of the Ukrainian conflict and on the assumption that it doesn't spread to other countries. But even so, I think the projections are going to be sobering. I don't have definitive figures, but it appears from a look around some of the uh, Gulf uh, news outlets that last year, uh, what the fund is going to say is that last year, global GDP growth was 6.1%. In January, the IMF predicted that it would be 4.3% in 2022. It now apparently says 3.6%, which is pretty devastating for the poorer countries. For 2023, it originally estimated that growth would be 3.8%. It's now looking at 3.6%, the same as this year. Plus, the fund is predicting that global inflation will be set to increase from 3.9% to 5.7%, with inflation in the emerging markets revised up from 5.9% to 8.7%. If you assume, as I think one must, that these are best case estimates, we're in real trouble. And they, I think they pose a real problem for central banks, perhaps a unique problem they've never had to face before. The problem, as I see it, is this. On the one hand, there's absolutely no doubt that the world is facing a very sharp increase in inflation. And I think the fund is living in cloud cuckoo land if it thinks that global inflation won't go above 5.7%. The cost of living is already the number one political issue from, what, from Peoria to Paris, swamping even concerns about the possibility of nuclear escalation in Ukraine. It has politicians' full attention now. On the other hand, the situation with growth, with economic growth, is more complex and I think less unequivocal. There are lots of reasons to believe that a global recession is on the cards, but it is not inevitable and the data doesn't all point in the same direction, in particular as far as labour markets are concerned. What therefore should a central banker do if if he or she withdraws COVID era stimulus too fast, or if he or she jacks up interest rates as per the central bankers users manual to choke off inflation, the danger is that the possibility of recession will become 100% certainty. And if there's anything politicians like less than double digit inflation, it's double digit unemployment. True, labor markets are indeed currently very tight, but that is as much a result of a shrinking active labor force with people staying out of voluntarily staying out of the labor force as it is a reflection of strong demand and it can turn nasty very quickly. So again, what should policymakers more broadly, central bankers and governments in general, what should they do? Well, the first thing is, I guess, to look at the evidence. On inflation, it's pretty clear. Last week, the big news was that the US CPI, the Consumer Price Index, jumped 1.2% in March, pushing the year-on-year -year inflation rate up from 79 to 8.5%, the highest rate since 1981. Whew. Admittedly, this was in part due to a 47% increase in the cost of gasoline, and that should ease as prices come down a little. But core inflation, that is X food and energy, also rose from 6.4% to 6.5%. And on top of that, and very worrying to me, the PPI, the producer price index in the US also rose from 10.3% to 11.2%, with core PPI up from 8.7 to 9.2%. Plus, on top of all of that, US in expectations about higher inflation are now becoming entrenched, and that'll be very hard to shift. And it isn't just a US phenomenon. 
Here in the UK, for instance, it was also reported last week that the CPI rose from 6.2 to 7% last month, with core inflation up from 5.2 to 5.7%. And here, the retail price index, which is still used for all sorts of things, rose from 8.2% to 9%. <laughs> As for the UK's producer price index, which I guess is a fair predictor of future CPI inflation, the input PPI rose from 15.1% to 19.2%, while the output PPI rose from 10.2% to 11.9% and probably will go higher because of the squeeze. Same is generally true throughout the EU, with the German uh, CPI up last week from 5.5 to 7.6%. Spanish inflation also jumped from 7.6 to 9.8%. Well, it's not so bad in France, where inflation only rose from uh, last month from 4.2 to 5.1%, but the direction is clear. And just to keep things in perspective, producer prices in Germany were up 22.6% last month, year on year, which doesn't bode very well. Clearly, inflation is less of an issue in Asia than it is in the US or Europe, but even there, it's headed up. And there's no sign yet that price pressure is going to ease, particularly given the supply chain disruption in China. Under these circumstances, well, it's no wonder that most central banks have chosen to act. After all, inflation is part of their mandate in a way that maintaining economic growth usually isn't. Last week, for instance, the Bank of Canada, which has been a leader in this, uh, pushed its reference rate up again, this time by a half percentage point. And it is pretty clear that the Fed and the Bank of England are also minded to do the same. Indeed, in the US, three voting members of the Federal Open Market Committee made it very clear last week that they intend to vote for a half point increase in the funds rate next month. The ECB, the European Central Bank, however, is a bit of a laggard. And Last week, it sat on its hands yet again. The rationale offered by its managing director, Christine, or its president, Christine Lagarde, was, in my opinion, reasonably unconvincing that the EU economy is, or the EU recovery is lagging that of the US. But I do think she has a case for inaction, given all the uncertainty over the Ukrainian situation, <coughs> and given the uh, dependence of Germany, of Italy, of Austria, of the Netherlands in particular, on Russian energy. Mm. Still, it is, I think, significant that the euro sold off when the ECB didn't increase interest rates. Markets are now braced for higher interest rates and I think are genuinely disappointed when they don't get them. As for growth, as I say, it's, the growth situation is somewhat trickier. Like most economists, I'm, I'm worried about a, a, a global recession, but I concede that the evidence for it is still lacking. In the US, for instance, the big economic news last week was a 0.5% gain in retail sales last month, which would have been even stronger had not supply chain issues hit automobile sales. On top of that, both industrial production and manufacturing output were up 0.9% in March, while the Empire State, that's the New York Manufacturing Index, improved from minus 11.8 to plus 24.6 in April. That's a big jump. Perhaps more important than that, the flash estimates for, that's the preliminary estimates for the influential Michigan Confidence Index, uh, rose for this month, jumped unexpectedly from 59.4 to 65.7. That's, that's a big change and, and something that caught the markets by surprise. On top of all that, I read over the weekend that it is also now being reported that credit card spending in the first quarter of this year caught the banks by surprise. It was much stronger than expected, up anywhere from 25 to 30% year on year, depending on what credit card you're looking at. So maybe we shouldn't be quite as worried about, in, uh, about growth as we have been, at least not yet, or at least not in the US. In Europe, I fear that it might be 
a different matter. Indeed, the, the big economic news last week on this side of the Atlantic was a sharp fall in the ZEW economic sentiment index, both for the Eurozone as a whole and in particular for Germany, for, for the former, for the Eurozone. The index fell from minus 38.7 to minus 43 in April. For the latter, that is for Germany alone, it fell from minus 39.3 to minus 41. Not such a big move, but a significant move and in the wrong direction. There, also, the current conditions index fell from minus 21.4 to minus 30.8, which is pretty devastating. As for here in the UK, it is, as, as always, a mixed picture. On the positive side, it was reported last week that the unemployment rate fell from a very low 3.9% to a, an even lower 3.8% in February, and that average earnings, that's including bonuses, were up 5.4% year on year, up from 4.8% in January. Of course, though that looks pretty good, it's still lagging behind inflation. On the other hand, according to the British Retail Consortium, retail sales in the UK fell 0.4% in March, and GDP itself was up just 0.1% in February. On balance, I, I don't really think there's anything in the figures to stop the Bank of England continuing to tighten UK interest rates. So I concede that Andrew Bailey and his friends should certainly be keeping a sharp eye on the real economy. One country where the signs are perhaps even harder to read than in the UK uh, is China not least because of the pernicious impact of its pretty futile zero COVID strategy, which has meant that Shanghai, population 25 million, has been in full or partial economic lockdown for most of the last month. Over the weekend, it was reported that Chinese retail sales were down 3.5% year on year in March, which was significantly worse than expected. And that reinforced the uh, growing conviction that China's economic miracle is in some danger of a sharp reversal. Plus, it was also reported that the urban unemployment rate has now hit 5.8%, which is genuinely terrifying to Politburo members who feel that the Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy is dependent on maintaining a, shall we say, happy workforce. On the other hand, however, it was also reported over the weekend that in China, industrial production was up 5.05% in year on year in March, and that GDP was up 4.8% over the first quarter, which was a good deal better than the 4.0% that had been anticipated. I genuinely don't know how to read these, these figures, but I do suspect that while the Chinese economy was actually outperforming the rather gloomy expectations of people like me in January and February, the zero COVID strategy, stupid and self-defeating as it is, really hit hard last month and will go on hitting hard as long as supply chains are disrupted, as long as whole cities and and not just Shanghai, are put into lockdown every time there is a case of COVID. After all, um, I also read that um, after 150,000 cases of COVID in Shanghai, only three people are reported to have died of it. They were between 88 and 91 years old and all were unvaccinated. Why on earth have they shut the entire city down? But China's problems being self-inflicted are, I suppose, sui generis, though they do have, obviously, a big impact on the rest of humanity. What they don't do is provide much of a pointer for how central banks and finance ministries should behave. They, I fear, will have to use their own judgment. But given the certainty of higher inflation and the uncertainties around recession, I don't see much reason for, main, for monetary authorities to hold off on tightening. It's got to be done. That said, the potential impact on markets is considerable. In the United States, for instance, all the three main equity indices were down last week. The Dow by 0.4%, the S&P by 2.4%, and NASDAQ by 2.9%. Over the last month, while the Dow has been almost flat, 
the S&P is down 0.5% and NASDAQ is down 1.9%. In Europe, I guess things are a bit better last week. For instance, the Zetradax in Germany was up 0.6% and the FTSE 100 over here was up 0.9%. Uh, the CAC 40 in Paris, as a result of the election, was up actually 2%. However, month on month, only the FTSE is up in, in, in Europe. The Dow in particular is down 1.6%. This is far from being a bear market, but it is a market that has lost most of its upward momentum. That's also true, obviously, of bond markets, although the yield curve inversion of a couple of uh, weeks ago in the US has been replaced by a, norm, a more normal curve. The 10-year Treasury benchmark yield in America rose last week from 2.72 to 2.83%, and the consensus seems to be that, as in Europe, rates will go higher. Indeed, they uh, have to, since official that market rates will go higher since they have to, as official rates are still deeply negative. Now, obviously, I'm way past making predictions as to when the equity uh, bubble will pop, but it does appear that the bond market bubble has already done so, and that must be a warning sign. Again, however, I don't think that, uh, that that provides a particularly strong reason for central banks to ignore the rise in inflation with all its adverse social implications. That rise is real. Recession and market meltdown are still hypothetical. Finally, a word on politics. First, I think I should say something about the French presidential election. The reason is that over the last few weeks, I've argued, first of all, that Macron is a shoo-in. Secondly, that Eric Zemmour would undermine Marine Le Pen's chances by splitting the right-wing vote. And thirdly, that the real star is of the story is the rise of Jean-Luc Mélenchon, an old-time, old-line Trotskyite who's something of the appeal that Jeremy Corbyn had, at least very briefly. And so, indeed, it came to pass. Now, the media is bigging up the chances of Le Pen in the April 24th runoff, despite the fact that no one, no one to the left of Macron, which is 60% of the electorate, will vote for her. Though I admit quite a lot of them will sit on their hands and abstain. Two of the bookies now make Macron a four to one on favourite. And that's, in my opinion, about right. He's offering all sorts of goodies to the left in terms of higher pensions and a higher minimum wage, but he really doesn't have to. Le Pen simply can't win. As for the UK, well, I hesitate to criticise Rishi Sunak or his wife, a member of the Murti family, a so-called Tambran and an heir to the Infosys fortune for either their non-DOM status or for holding green cards. I'm vulnerable on that. But Boris must have breathed a sigh of relief. I, like most, had thought that Partygate was long, long past her. But then it reared its nasty head again with, I guess, more to come, perhaps this week from Sue Gray. Still, with Sunak now out of the way as a potential rival, Bojo must be pretty safe, though maybe someone should dig up the terms of his settlement uh, that he negotiated with the US IRS to settle his US tax liability. I bet the feds were a lot kinder to him than they are to most people with US tax delinquencies. Uh, okay, as for this week, well, I'll try to focus on the spring meetings and on what the G20, which is also meeting in the margins of the spring meetings, has to say about the global economy. As far as economic releases are concerned, the most significant is probably the Fed's monthly beige book survey of US economic conditions, which is raw material for the May FOMC meeting. Other than that, uh, can I thank you for watching again? And I hope to see you again next week. Many thanks.